Not able to be with us last night. Uh, he was driving up from Virginia, where he now is a pastor in a, a church in the middle of nowhere. That's right. A, a perfect place for Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Dan first came to Chehi Summer School of Music 20 years ago this summer. It's true. Chahi. And uh, those of you who have been uh, able to be under his teaching the last several years know he's uh, a blessing to us. But I've got to tell one story on Dan, just, just for the fun of it. His sister Amy, who is a wonderful viola player, was a Chehiite before Dan was. She came to camp for a year or two and went home and told Dan how wonderful it was. He didn't care. He plays trumpet or played trumpet, but he didn't care until she said, Dan, you got to go. There are three times as many girls as there are guys. And Dan said, I'm going. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> He's learned to since then, though, that uh, Che is much more than just guys Amen. and girls. So Amen. God bless you as you preach, Thank brother. You. And yep. uh, bring what God wants us to hear. Yep. I, um, I originally signed up for two weeks that summer, and I got there, realized what she said was true, and I called home and said, can I stay for two more weeks? So, um, um, It's so good to be back, and great to see so many familiar faces, and a lot of you do know me and, and know part of my story, and you know uh, how vital this ministry was and is and has been in my life, and so it's such a great privilege to be back here with you guys this week, and uh, looking forward to a, a great week. Uh, prayed a lot about what to to share this week, and the Lord directed me to uh, to have us talk this week about our words. So this week we're going to be thinking about our mouth, our words, our tongue, and. For me, uh, this was an area that when I was a camper here, God began to convict me deeply of because I didn't always talk the way God would have me to talk. And one of the things that I found out in life is that this thing inside of our mouth is hard to control. The last two summers that I've been here, I've shared a message on the tongue, on the mouth, but this week we're going to spend a whole week thinking about our words. So thinking about that, getting us started off, you've probably heard it said what? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. All right, how many of you realize that's a pretty big lie? Are you with me? All right. All right, obviously, whoever said this, whoever came up with this was probably deaf, okay? <laughs> like, that's my, my suspicion on the matter. All right, because words are powerful. Words have great power. In fact, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said this. He says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so I just kind of wanted to zero in on that, on that thought. The tongue has the power of life and death. That's, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? He says, our, our mouth, our tongue, our words within them is the power of death and the power of life. And so this week, I want us to gain insight and instruction from God's Word about our words. Because our words are one of the most important and influential parts of who we are. And we have great power with our word. Your spoken words have great power and influence. Your Facebook words have great power and influence. Now, I know for many of you, Facebook is like old news, old school. It's for old people, all right? So your Twittered word, your texted words, your Instagrammed words, if you actually use words on Instagram, right? I know it's mostly pictures. But all of our words have power. Now, uh, I just heard this, this past week, for, for those of you who use Gmail, uh, there's now a feature on there that lets you choose to unsend your email 30, up to 30 seconds after you send it. This, this is true from what I've heard. So you send the email, right, and then about 15 seconds later you realize, that was probably a bad idea because expressing my full feelings and my full heart to this person right now probably isn't the best course of action. So you can actually hit unsend and they'll never see it. It doesn't get delivered for 30 seconds. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if, if, if we could do that in life with our words? How many of you, if you had the ability to have the power to take back anything you said within 30 seconds, would you take that? All right. Because here's the thing, all of us can relate to the fact that we've all said things that we wish we hadn't said. And we've all experienced what it's like to be on the receiving end 
of that as well. I mean, how, how many of you could say, just be honest, say, I've been hurt by somebody's words. I mean, really hurt. All right. I mean, that's just about all of you, and probably you that didn't raise your hands, you have been. Like, we've all experienced the pain and the wounds that words can inflict on us. Maybe it was when you were growing up. Maybe it was from a parent. Maybe it was from a teacher, a coach, a friend. Maybe it was from somebody that you really thought you could trust, but they said something that deeply hurt you. It deeply wounded you. We've all experience that, both positively and negatively. We know the power of our words. Words have energy, they have power. Words can heal, words can injure, words can comfort, or they can kill. The tongue has the power of life and death. And as we think about that, if we really believe that the tongue has the power of life and death, then we ought to be careful about what comes out of our mouth, right? You with me? If, if we have something that's so powerful, that it has the power of life and death, and yet so often we just carelessly let our words slip out of our mouth, we ought to consider the power of our words a little bit more seriously. Because here's the thing, fights, divorces, arguments, riots, wars have all started simply because of words. And sometimes our words cause pain and hurt that goes for a lifetime. Here's what Jesus had to say about it. I want us to, to think about that. We're going to end up in James chapter 3 in just a couple of minutes. But this is what Jesus had to say about our words. He says, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings out the evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And so there are some pretty serious words this morning from, from Jesus about our words and the importance that he places on what comes out of our mouths. And so I want that thought to kind of guide our thinking as we look at God's word this week, as we think about our words and how we use them, what God has to say about them. I want us to think about how seriously God takes our words. Words have great power. Your words have great power. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Now think about that. You are more powerful than you probably imagined because you have the power of death and life in your tongue. So understanding that we have this great power and understanding how hard it is, I want to look at James chapter 3 because James spends a whole lot of time talking about our words. So James chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 12. James 3 and uh, verses 2 through 12. So let's kind of just work through this a little bit and uh, make some observations. James says in, in verse 2, he says, We all stumble in many ways. This is verse 2, James chapter 3. He says, Those who are never at fault in what they say are perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And so what's James saying here? He's saying nobody is perfect. All right, now, how many of you have met somebody who thought they were perfect? All right, you, you all know someone like that? All right. All right, everybody knows somebody who thinks they're perfect. But here's the truth about all of us. None of us are perfect. Can we agree on that? Are, you, are we in good agreement? All right. None of us are perfect. Some of you are closer than others. Some of you are much further than others, right? Just kidding. All right. None of us are perfect. And James says, if you were perfect, then you would always be able to say exactly what you should say every single time. And since none of us have been able to do that, we know we're not perfect. He says, we all stumble in many ways, but if we were able to control what we say, we would be able to control our whole life. And so think about that. He says, if you can manage your mouth, if you can learn how to control your words... He says, your whole life can be controlled. No one has mastered it, but with God's power, we can see God transform our mouths, our talk, our speech. Now, everyone has said something that you wish you could take back, right? We all admitted that already, right? I just want you, just think back for a minute, all right? I know it's Monday morning, I know it's early, all right? I didn't get much sleep either, but let's just think for a moment. Think about a time where you, you, you said something and you wish you had that 30-second feature, all right? You got it? You remembering? 
All right, think about that. We all wish that we could take our words back. But here's the thing. Once your words leave your mouth, once you hit send, and now, of course, with Gmail, it's 30 seconds, but with your texting and your other devices, right, it's still when you hit send, right, when you hit post, right, it's there. It's irrecoverable. You can't take it back. You can't ever get it back. And so our tongues, which have the ability to hurt, to cut, to damage, to destroy, James says these things are very hard to control. Look at verse 3. He says, we put bits in the mouth of horses to make them obey us. And we can turn the whole animal or take a ship as an example. Verse 4, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. And so James gives us a couple pictures here, a couple illustrations. First of all, he uses a horse. And just to let you know, my five-year-old wants a horse, okay? She said that she's saving up for a horse. She asked for a horse, and I just think, you know, how do I break it to her that daddy's never going to be able to afford a horse at the current trajectory of my income, all right? But in in fact, we uh, were up at my in-laws who live in southern Maryland, not too long ago, and there's a lot of Amish in their area, and, and she saw the horse and buggies and was trying to explain that to her. And First of all, she asked why they didn't like cars, and I said, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, then she, uh, she came back from that, and she said, I'm not going to drive a car when I grow up. She said, I'm going to have a horse. <laughs> so that's her plan. You know, I'll, we'll see how that works out. He says, you can take this powerful, massive animal who's strong, who's, who's oftentimes sometimes strong-willed, and he says, you can put just a small thing inside its mouth, and you can now control this animal. You can control where it goes and what it does. He says, you can take a massive ship, and compared to the size of the ship, the rudder is relatively small, but the rudder determines the direction of the ship. It controls where the ship goes. And he says, it's the same way with our lives. Our tongue, in comparison to the rest of us physically, it's just a small part of who we are. But it has the power to influence your whole life. It has the power to direct your life. It has the power to control your life. And so thinking about how do we manage this tongue, how do we deal with our mouth? mouth is so important because the tongue is so powerful. Look at verse 5. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. So, so literally, he, he uses this picture. He says, if your tongue could talk. Now, that's kind of humorous, isn't it, right? Because we use our tongue to form words. But he says, if your tongue had a mouth, all right, if, could you just picture that for a moment? If your tongue, you got it. All right, um, some of you, you'll catch up. It's, it is kind of funny if you think about it. Um, but if your tongue had a mouth, James says it would brag about how powerful it was. If your tongue had a mouth, it would brag about how influential it was compared to the rest of the body. He says your tongue would boast of its power. He says consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. He says you can start a massive fire with just the tiniest of sparks. He says, the tongue also is a fire. So James uses this picture. He says, our tongue is like a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, for it corrupts the whole person. All right, your mouth, your words have the ability to corrupt, to ruin your whole life. And he says, it sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. So this is some pretty, pretty strong things that, that James says about our, our mouth, our tongue. He says, our words are powerful and their power to destroy is great. And he describes it as like a fire. Now, fire is good, right? Fire can be life-saving. Fire can be comforting. Fire is wonderful as what? As long as it's contained properly, as long as it's used in the proper way. But fire outside of its proper place is destructive and can destroy. And it's the same thing with our words. Your words have that power. And so James says, wants us to, to understand this power. But then he says, think about not only this power, but the power in your tongue to do evil. Um, the power to do it. Look at verse 6. And I just want us to think about some observations about the tongue. First of all, he says it can corrupt your whole life. He says it can corrupt your whole life. Your mouth has the ability to destroy your life. Your words 
Not only can inflict damage to other people, not only can you use your tongue to hurt someone, and listen, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've ever used your words to hurt someone, all right? All right, because I don't want to raise my hand. But we realize that not only do our words have the ability to hurt others, but it can destroy our life as well. It can corrupt your life. It can ruin your life. And he says it's influenced by Satan. It's set on fire, he says, by hell. And really a very vivid picture here because he uses the word Gehenna in, in the the recipients of James' letter, these early Christians, early Jewish Christians, would have been familiar with Jerusalem. And there was literally a valley of Gehenna. And it's where they took the waste, the refuse, the trash, and it burned, right, continually there. So now if you can just imagine that smell, right? So he says this smoldering, nasty trash pile. And he says that is a picture of our tongue. He says our tongues, our words are influenced by Satan and unchecked and not brought under God's power. Your tongue will cause great pain and great evil because no one can tame the tongue. Look at verse 7. He says, by nature, your tongue is an instrument of evil. And so, you know, thinking about the instrument that you play, he says, think of your tongue as an instrument, an untamed, unchecked, not brought under God's power. Your tongue is an instrument of evil. He says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by human beings. And so that, you know, it always amazes me how, how we can tame animals. You know, it, you, know, you know, you go to SeaWorld. Anybody ever been to SeaWorld? All right. Know of SeaWorld, right? I mean, the fact that you can train a killer whale, that, that, that just, I, I'm not smart enough to understand how that happens. Some of you may be, right? But that just amazes me that we can teach a whale to do what we want, right? We can train it and it responds. He says, we've tamed all kinds of animals. He says, we can tame animals, but we cannot tame our tongue. Look at verse 8. He says, no one... And if you're an underliner or a highlighter, he says, no one, you might want to underline, no one can tame the tongue. Right? You might be thinking, well, you know, other people can't control their mouth, but I can control it. I, I can say what I want to say when I want to say it. But James says, no, don't think that way. Because no one can tame the tongue. No one is able to completely control their mouth. He says, it is a restless evil full of deadly Poison. So here he says, inside your mouth is something that has the power, Solomon already said it has the power of death and life, and James describing the death part, he says, your tongue is a restless evil and it's full of poison. All right, so you have this ability, he says, you have this deadly poison in your mouth, all right? So, you know, you guys might want to think about that, right? You have this deadly poison in your mouth, and he says, we have the ability to shoot that poison out with our words. Right? We have the ability to launch that out at people. And he says it's something we need to all be aware of because no one can tame their tongue. What I've realized is that even for those of us who know Christ, who love Jesus, who have been saved, are being saved, will be saved, we still struggle with our mouth. It's a hard area of our life to manage. And one of the things that we do sometimes is we praise God, we worship God with our tongue, right? We give Him praises like we did this morning, we should. But then we turn around with that same tongue and we curse people made in God's image. We speak negatively to them, we hurt them, we tear them down, we gossip, we slander, we cut. And James says that ought not to be. Look at verse 9. He says, with the tongue... We praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. The greatest thing that you can do with your tongue is to praise God, to give Him glory and honor and blessing and praise. That's the greatest thing that you can do with your words. But he says the greatest thing that we can do with the words, then we turn around and we use it to curse, to cut, to hurt, to speak death instead of life, to speak curses instead of blessings. And when I, when I talk about curses, I'm not just talking about you know, four-letter words, right? I'm talking about what we pronounce over people's lives, what we say about them, what we say about them to them or to others. We so often speak death instead of life. And James says that ought not to be. Look how bluntly he puts it in verse 11. 
He says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? He says, does a spring, can it be salty and fresh all at the same time? He says, my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? Right? Just, he says, can, he, can a fig tree make olives? No. He says, can a grapevine bear figs? No. Then neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What is he saying? He's saying nature is consistent. Right? Nature is consistent. Grape vines make grapes. Fig trees make figs. But he says, your mouth is not consistent. He says, nature is consistent, but your mouth is not consistent. Sometimes you bless God, and sometimes you curse people. And he says, that ought not to be. And so, we have to step back then and think, okay, I, I, I get that. Solomon says, death and life from the power of the tongue. So I've got this really, really extremely powerful thing that I have to manage in life. Right? All of us have to manage our mouth. Jesus says, for every word, he will hold us accountable. So this is a serious matter, right? It's death and life. Jesus says, I'll hold you accountable for it. James says, no one can tame it. No one can control it. It will set your whole life on fire. It directs your life. It controls your life. So what do we do? How do we handle our mouth management? Well, we're going to talk about that all week. But just a few things this morning that I want us to to think about. Uh, Three actions that I want to share with you. Number one, recognize the power of your words. I, I want you to understand this morning that, that this isn't just something we're talking about. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Recognize that your words have great power and great influence. Great opportunity to bless, to do good, but also great opportunity to curse, to bring death. And so recognize the importance of yours. Number two, realize the importance that God places on your use of your words. Jesus says, I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. The reason he does is because of the great power that we have in our words. The great influence that we have in our words. Right? And God knows right, that this thing has the ability to direct the entire course of my life. It has the ability to affect other people's lives, but it has the ability to affect the entire course of my own life. And so realize the importance of your words. And then number three, to repent of the sin of your tongue. What does it mean to repent? Somebody tell me, what what does the basic idea of repenting mean? Yes. To turn back, to go a different direction, to do a 180, to go a different direction. And that's my desire for all of us this week, is that God would bring us to a place where if we realize that our tongue, our words, whether it's our spoken words or our written words, if there's an area of our life, an area of our our talking that, that we haven't dealt with, that God would bring us to a place where we go a different direction. Right? That we realize that, that God's forgiveness is available to us. And that we realize that He has a new direction for us to go. A new course for our talking. Because here's the thing. When, when I came here as, as a camper, right, God radically intersected my life. He awakened me to some realizations that I was not living out my faith in a very authentic way. I knew Christ as my Savior, but I was not engaged in living that out. And one of the major ways that that manifested was how I talked. All right? Growing up, when I was in uh, elementary school and in middle school, believe it or not, I got picked on a lot. All right? Anybody else? With me? All right. We all should sit at the same table today, all right? Commiserate. All right. And I heard a lot of cutting things, a lot of hurtful things were spoken to me. All right. I once got called uh, Danny Davis, Donald Duck, Double Dork. All right. You with me? That's painful. All right. Don't call me that. All right. (laughs) But then, even though I knew what it was like to be hurt by words, I got into high school. I thought, hey, if I want to fit in, if I want to, if I want to blend in, then, then I need to talk a certain way. And, and I would often, real, without realizing it, do the exact same thing to other people that had been so hurtful to me. And God really, truly, and deeply began to convict me as a camper here about the way 
that I talked. And God led me to repent of some of those sins. And listen, it's, is it still a battle? Absolutely. All right. All right. The, the managing of our tongue, our words, is a lifelong process. But God began to set a new direction. And that's my heart for you the, this week, is that God would set a new direction. Not just to avoid saying things that you'll regret. Not just to avoid saying things that are hurtful. But to realize the great importance that we have to speak life. To speak hope. To speak grace. And so that's my, my heart for you, is that God will change the way that you talk. But it begins by recognizing the power of your words. It begins by realizing how important this is to God. And then asking God, God, is there an area of my speaking that you want to change? And I want to ask you to be open that, to that this week. So let's just pray together, if you would, if you'd bow your heads. And, and let's just ask the Lord to, to open our hearts to uh, what He wants to do in our lives uh, this week, not just musically, which you're going to have a fantastic week of being, uh, getting some amazing instruction. God's brought you here so that you can be challenged, so that you can grow. But God's also brought you here to intersect your life spiritually. And I believe this week God wants to deal with how we talk. And so let's ask the Lord to work deeply. Father, I pray this morning that uh, we would come to a place this week where we realize how important our words are. And Father, we know it's a struggle for all of us. And as James tells us, we, we cannot by ourselves control our mouths, control our talk. But Father, we know that through the influence and the power of your Spirit, Father, you can transform the way that we talk. And so Father, I pray this morning that everyone here would recognize the power of their words. Father, I pray that they realize how important it is to you how we speak. And Father, I pray that we would repent of those areas in our life where we are not allowing your influence over our words. I pray that you would expose those areas. Father, even though it may not be comfortable, Father, I pray you would expose them, that you might forgive us, that you might correct us, and that you might chart for us a new and better course. So Father, that our lives might be great influences for your kingdom. Father, in a world that desperately needs to see you and know you. Father, we ask for your blessing over this day. Father, we pray that as we speak to one another, as we speak to those around us, may we speak life and encouragement and hope today. And Father, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, just give us a great day together. We thank you for the wonderful privilege of being here in this place once again. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.